Hello there everybody, it's Sabana92, aka Nightmare, and welcome back to Dies Irae Amantes Amentes in the last episode, Kasumi time. Okay, in what was obviously a censored scene, but it kind of got a little bit into that uh, unnecessarily detailed territory. And thankfully, a couple of you people, specifically Setsuna and a couple of others down in Discord, first off, shout out to you guys in Discord for kind of giving me a little bit of a warning for any other routes that might go into that territory. So thank you very much for that warning, those warnings just in general, so I can, you know, better prepare myself. So I don't get to the point where I'm just constantly reading off everything really, really fast and I'm having trouble and people can't keep up with what I'm going on. You know what I mean? Kind of like that. For anybody that just basically could not understand a single word I just said, I was just, you know, referencing the fact that I started fast talking like a Dickens and losing my mind a little bit there. Which, I don't know. I think I've gotten a little bit better with stuff like that. <laughs> Although that certainly didn't showcase I, I mean doing any better. <sighs> but yeah, also had a moment of Kasumi standing up to K, which the girls got balls right there. So good on you there, Kasumi. There were two kinds of dreams. Those you realized were dreams from the start, and those you didn't until you woke up. Either way, it didn't change the fact that the events of the dream were beyond the dreamer's control. What set them apart was whether or not the dream felt strange to the dreamer. And this thing I've been seeing now was without the doubt the latter. Oh! Something was swaying in front of me like a silhouette staring at me. What? No, who was this? Every human shape I saw was so horribly tiny. Children? Were those children? There were dozens, hundreds. Oh, maybe even over a thousand children around me, swaying. They started speaking as though they were singing. <laughs> What? As opposed to a blue or a green, uh, red fount? Butter. Well, to be fair, I I don't even really know you, so I can't really answer that effectively. Well, I mean, there's a possibility that you're wanted. It really all just depends on the person and just what's going on in the situation. Well, that's just your prerogative. Having... Wouldn't having home mean you have a place to go back to? I need to shut up. I don't know. If another certain visual novel has told me anything, eternity is actually the worst possible thing. Oh, so you have yourself a very extended family. Again, as long as you're having fun. No, of course not. If you were the sun, then you'd probably burn around everybody that's, you know, around you. Good job speaking in tune. I didn't understand a word they said. The childlike voices seemed cheerful, yet for some reason my heart ached as I listened to them. The one thing I did not, uh, the one thing I did understand was that they meant no harm. In fact, they seemed rather friendly. I know, right? They're very cordial. They all spoke as if I was their friend. One of them. I didn't know how that made sense, nor did I want to. And at that moment, I experienced something I never thought I would. 
I fell unconscious inside a dream. Well, I've dreamt inside a dream, and it's trippy as all hell. Let me tell you a story from my past. A memory of a certain family. The circumstances, skeletons in the closet, common to any household, yet kept sealed under a veil of darkness. They were sensitive to these things, and could not leave a pure soul that had been wounded unchecked. Let's take a closer look. Oh! We have a lone boy here. He lost his parents at a young age, and was taken in by the family of one of their friends. But was that really the truth? The boy was young. Not only did he have no memories of his parents, he didn't even know their names or birthdays. He was given no choice but to believe the backstory which was only latently imprinted on him. That was hardly an unheard-of situation. In the end, he was told who he was by those who now called themselves his parents, and he believed it without question. Now, I really have no idea if we're actually, you know, in somebody else's perspective or Ren's perspective, but I'm gonna go with the latter that he's- that this is not his perspective. Unless it- unless it obviously changes that. Also, young Ren! Look at this! I kinda feel bad for the poor kid. Also, you might wanna fix your shirt, pal. Although, with the way that collar is, that could fit a watermelon through it. That or Squidward's head. If one removed the emotional circumstances of the matter and only judged it through reason, they would have realized just how vague that information was. However, there were very few children in the world who would ever be able to take such an objective stance with their parents. In other words, it was extremely easy to have children believe fabrications, especially those pertaining to their roots. Well, children are very impressionable. I mean, they're still growing up, they're still learning. They still have problems trying to decipher between what is real and what is fake. And that was what happened to this boy. A peculiar, but hardly difficult situation to design. An immoral act that was literally like taking candy from a baby. But parents or guardians shouldn't be able to commit such a malicious act. People tend to overlook such cases because this type of common sense has been instilled into our society. A trap that lurks within our day-to-day -day life. Oh my god, I'm switching into the Frieza Morgana voice. God damn it. May as well go all the way. Of course, it took some time to some effort to hide those sort of things from the eyes of the public, but it was hardly an impossible feat. It was a problem that could influence a person's entire life, yet most of the time it was difficult to prevent. Even though everyone would agree that people who took advantage of such situations were wicked beyond salvation. On the outside, the boy was welcomed into the family with open arms. At the very least. His foster mother and the girl the same age as him, or at least that was what he was told, were fond of him. But even if their affection was genuine, who could say they really lived in the same environment as him? What about your parents? Your siblings? Are they the real deal? Well, according to the paperwork they are, I'm pretty sure. That or maybe that fall that I had about a few years back really did jog some part of my brain and really I'm just living in a fantasy world. That sucks. That would actually explain a lot though. What about your husband? Your wife? Did you really choose them out of your own will? Um, first off, I'm not married. So, but I did choose the girl I'm in love with. No one doubts things like these, and that is why there are people who take advantage of that fact. Even now, the boy's memories of that time were considerably vague. He couldn't remember the things he did day after day in detail, and perhaps he was better off not remembering. He had only one vivid and unforgettable memory. Oh God! Of his foster father dying before his eyes. No, to be more accurate, of him being murdered. It had been the boy's own friend who had done it, and the boy himself helped cover it up. Oh my god! There were two boys of tender years at the time, although one could say they had matured quite early. Perhaps that was just one of their talents. 
they made his death look like an accident. The deceased was not one to get drunk easily, but anyone was capable of getting a bit tipsy and missing a step climbing the stairs. Climbing the stairs and then falling and causing this much blood? Not unless his head just fucking completely decapitated from his own body. That are just... Those are some fucking sharp stairs. He had just been unlucky that there had been a blade lying at the bottom that stabbed right through his neck. That is... <laughs> I should- that is the most- okay. No one was surprised. After all, there was hardly a room in his house that had no sharp objects displayed on the wall. Oh shit, this might actually explain his aversion to sharp objects. And no one suspected that children could have been the real perpetrators. After all, on the outside they had been a perfectly happy family, a fact they used to their advantage to veil the truth. The thing that had surprised people was that the seemingly harmless man had been hiding a secret passage that laid underground in his room. What they found at the end had been a room that looked uncannily like a mad scientist's laboratory straight out of a horror movie. The boys weren't even the ones who discovered the body. Had they been found having a connection to the lab, they would undoubtedly become suspects. So the father had a lab? Uh, what kind of lab? I, I, actually, I probably should. I don't want to know that. As such, they feigned ignorance. The boy's friend had first acted exasperated and annoyed by the idea, but the, in the end, he acquiesced. Wait, maybe it was, Oh my god, was it Shiro? That helped? The man's whereabouts, who until then was thought of having disappeared, only came to light when the scent of rotting flesh began to fill the house. Years later, his friend told the boy he thought they left the body to rot to make the autopsy more difficult. Perhaps it was so and that was why he regretted his choice. He did not know whether that was the right thing to do. He hadn't covered the incident up out of self-preservation. It wasn't like he'd been the one to actually kill the man, so he hadn't felt scared of the crime at the time, but neither did he do it to protect his friend. It seemed his friend was openly proud of his deed, and that it forced the boy to make that choice. But once the whole thing came to light, his friend would doubtlessly bluntly state his motive if only asked for it. What would happen as a result? Everything would fall apart. The boy's entire family. His friend told him that family had never even existed to begin with. But as long as there were those who believed it had, the boy had to do everything within his power to protect it. So he had chosen to cover up the incident and succeeded but in the end, had that really been a good thing? Could he really say he hadn't been ashamed at all? As a result, a foreign substance had mixed in with his family, with his day-to-day -day life. One that carried the unreal stench of decay and death. His friends said it had been that way to begin with, but as long as there were those who believed in the fabrication, the boy couldn't let it be destroyed. Though his friend had done the killing, the boy himself was no less a murderer in that sense. It would have put him more at ease if he had been able to pass the killing off as a disappearance, but that had been impossible. Passion could only drive a child's limits so far. And so he regretted his action to this day. What should he have done? What could he have done? Should he have said something? Should he have remained silent? Even now? Yes, even now he didn't know what he should have done. He'd have to come to a conclusion someday, as much as he was scared of that day coming. If only time would stop. If only this moment would last an eternity. Though he'd thought that. The fight happened. The very fight on that fated day. He couldn't believe that his friend was just up and about leaving him and moving forward, while he himself had yet to come to terms. He was trying to be bring the seal the truth to light by himself. So he had to stop him. He'd wanted to stop him. <sighs> so in the end, it really had been self-preservation. He'd been un unable to let go of the present where he and Kasumi happened to be on such good terms. In the end, all had boiled down to that point alone. 
You know, if you probably reveal this to Kasumi at that point, there might be a, oh. Chapter 12, Skeleton in the Closet. I can hear Papyrus in the distance. You know, if you brought this up to Kasumi, there's a possibility that, you know, she already thinks she's probably going to go to, she, she's already of the mind that she's gonna to go to hell because she thinks she's the murderer and all that. But if you're a murderer, you can go to hell together. God, that sounds so fucked up. The first thing she felt was the presence of satisfaction, slowly welling up as though she'd been sleeping at the bottom of the sea. Kasumi Ayase had woken up a reborn person. It must have been raining outside. She could tell from the slight change of pressure in the room. But it wouldn't rain that long. The rain was soft and gentle. It probably would be over by the time Kasumi made her resolve to leave. And so, she decided to keep watching his face for a little longer. For a Ren was breathing peacefully. So many surprising things had happened in such a short time. Kasumi herself was having trouble making sense of it all. Of herself, of Ihimuro, of Father Tarifa, and... Kasumi... Sumabai... Ren! She was startled by Ren's sudden bout of sleep talk. His face scrunched up in what was clearly anguish. <laughs> Uh, don't go start blaming yourself for everything, man. It was a distant memory of her childhood, of her father's death. She had no proof, but after spending so much time with Ren, she felt like she finally understood everything. Under normal circumstances, Ren would have been perfectly justified to hate her. That had to be why she kept watching over his face as he, as he slept. She loved Ren from the bottom of her heart, but she didn't have the courage to turn to him and look him in the eye. That was probably why she kept looking at his face now. She gently kissed him. She was worried it would wake him up, and a part of her actually wished he, he would. That silent yet soft kiss was filled with Kasumi's feelings. Ren would probably notice his kiss after he woke up. Then he'd go desperately searching for her once he realized she was gone. That was just how he was. Ren had always been protecting her. The boy who'd burned himself with secrets and kept trying to protect her. The girl who feigned ignorance as the boy put on a mask of false stoicism. Both were suffering. Their relationship was too earnest and clumsy. She wiped away the tears that welled up in her eyes and turned her back to Ren. The resolve she'd finally mustered would waver if she looked at him any longer. She'd wanted to hear his voice one last time. Oh no, don't you, do go, don't you go fucking going away! But knowing him, he'd never approve of her actions. If anything, he'd force her to stay at this club and go out all on his own. She was sure of that. She had to keep that from happening. Otherwise, this cycle would just keep repeating. That was why she was satisfied with the sight of Ren's pretty sleeping face being her final memory of him. Her courage wouldn't fade away if he saw her off with that face. He'd been calling out her name in his sleep for a while now. Perhaps he was dreaming of her at that moment. That alone was enough for Kasumi. She left without taking a shower. She didn't want Ren sent to leave her. She pondered what she should wear, only to smile when she realized how silly she was to be seriously considering something like that. In the end, she put on her Sukinasawa high uniform. It was a symbol of the day-to-day -day life she'd spent with Ren. Truly her Sunday best.
She shut off the lights to cut ties to whatever lingering attachment she had left. Well, fuck! Kasumi left the bottomless pit, located on the western side of the central district and headed for the east without the slightest hesitation. No one was out this late at night because of the serial killings. They doubtlessly locked their doors and hold themselves up in their homes. Even if there were people with greater senses of curiosity than fear, those were all the type that would hang out at the bottomless pit, and Lisa and Kane had already made sure none of them were left. She wished she'd taken Shiro up a while back on his joke and offered to teach her how to ride a motorcycle. Then she could just steal his and, you know, not be forced to make this long trek. Just when every, just when had everything gone wrong? Kasumi, Ren, and Shiro were no three amigos. Theirs was a relationship like a deformed triangle. No matter how you spun it, they were an unbalanced combination. Even so, they'd always been together. To put it in a bad way, they'd been selfish. But put in a good way, one could say they were tied by a relationship of mutual unreserve. I guess that's certainly a way of putting that. That was enough for Kasumi. She wanted nothing more, and she thought that was the way she'd always live. The nature of that relationship had changed considerably, but even so, she didn't want to think they had completely broken apart, or that there was no going back. And that was why she'd settle everything this very night. Oh no. <laughs> God, don't get yourself killed! The light rain turned into a drizzle, eventually stopping completely and dispersing into mist as though reluctant to leave. The pale moon shone in a gap between the rain clouds above the church. She hadn't been directed where to go. This was simply the only place Kasumi could think of. Shit. On that day... Oh, finally skipping. Okay, finally coming back to this. What the fuck happened? She remembered what Kay had said. How that man was one of them. His smile and words triggered a severe irregularity in Kasumi's brain. That was the first thing Kasumi blurted out in her confusion. Huh? By contrast, the priest responded in the flattest voice possible. When she saw the priest look as though she'd caught him off guard, Kasumi herself grew confused. Uh, His smile brought her way back for it was the same smile he'd given on that day they first met. Kasumi's mind went blank for a moment. Her caution lost its footing and collapsed. Oh. The priest let out a sigh. At the weakness of people's souls. At the root of every man lay a craving to ignore reality and perceive only the convenient truths. Rifa looked around the amusement park with love in his eyes. Truly the picture of tranquility itself. Whoops. Oh yeah. You mean the, um, the, 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 dead, the dead children? Yeah, yeah, I can certainly. Oh, God. Torifo reached out as though he were caressing air, almost as if something or someone was there. I'm一人一人の名前は知らない。ああだの、べえだの、愛んだの、つばい。愛んつばい、ドライ。しかし、顔は覚えている。その魂を記憶している。She was hallucinating. At least, she hoped she was. There was no way there were hundreds of children floating around Tarifa. Kasumi 
あなた方は私にとって勝利の天使だ兄弟ジブリン Who is he talking about? イザークが哀れでならないそうでしょうそうですともそしてだからこそ一人だけ仲間外れのヨハンもまたかわいそう Oh yeah, those names were brought up earlier Isaac and Johan 兄弟ならば皆が一緒に彼らはそう望んでいますがあなたはどうですか綾瀬さん Oh, oh, they opened, they opened <laughs> Tarifa's eyes, always as thin as slits, widened He slowly reached out for Kasumi's cheek あなたに罪というものがあるのならそれは無知であったこと蚊帳の外はつらかったでしょう仲間外れは悲しかったでしょういつも思っていたはずだ私もその輪に入りたいならばよしあなたにできることを教えましょう彼らがあなたを誘ってくれる彼らは傷つく子供を見ていられない His hand finally reached Kasumi. しかるのち答えをお聞かせ願いたい<笑>これは夢だが夢ではない a dream yet not a dream so either inception or Schrodinger's nightmare a memory of a certain family the circumstances skeletons in the closet common to any household yet kept sealed under a veil of darkness あなたはそれを知るべきだ。By the way, your boyfriend has a guillotine woman living in his arm. That is what you need to know. What? <laughs> the joyous voices of countless small children entered Kasumi the moment the priest's hand touched her cheek. Yes, this was a skeleton in the closet. A story of a mother and many blessed children. Only those who were raised in similar circumstances could see it. But once seen, it would seize one's soul. The condition for seeing this dream was having been raised by an abnormal parent. There once was an organization called Lebensborn, the Fount of Life. It was a welfare organization that had been founded in 1936 to mitigate the population decline in Germany after World War I, and to support the ever growing number of widows and orphans created by the war. Wait, is this like a real thing? Germany had lost the Great War. I mean, I mean the, the whole Lebensborn thing. The, the I... And with that, the country found itself in a state of hyperinflation brought about from paying off the enormous reparations. Forced onto them by the victors and the biting influence of the Great Depression. As a result, the unemployment rate rose well to over 30%, and it went without saying that public order was a disaster. Virtually everyone living in Germany at that time had it hard in some way. That was why an organization like Leskinen was born. God damn it! Lebensborn! Fuck! Was born. To protect the women and children who would weave the future. Men were merely living goods meant to shed blood and die, and so no one could argue they were useless when it came to the succession and nurturing of life. In this era, there was only one thing for German men to do it was to win the upcoming world war and reclaim the German pride and strength, to form the cornerstone that children of the next generation could be proud of. So, the existence of an organization like Lebensborn, where women would nurture those new lives, was essential. Oh, hi. The heroine of this dream thus confirmed to his this principle and became a member of the Fount of Life. From the very beginning, she understood the concepts of the strength of motherhood and the significance of allotting fitting roles to both men and women, the importance of not stepping outside one's bounds, as well as respecting and helping one another. For that was the basics, the basis of love and happiness. She graduated from the band of German maidens, BDM, above her peers. 
She, who establishing herself in Lebensborn in a blink of an eye, ended up raising the seeds that would lead Germany to that bright future, was without a doubt a model German woman. As such, it was not particularly surprising that in contemporary Germany, she ended up obtaining one of the highest and most revered positions in the social stratum. Her influence was on par with an army major. In a, in a Germany that was slowly rising from the depths of poverty and turning into the Totenkampf Empire, her, presence, her position was something even most men could only aspire to. Okay, I am pro I'm probably mispronouncing, I'm butchering the, the pronunciations of a lot of these words, aren't I? Lisa Brenner, the woman who would later become to be called Babylon, the Great Mother. Oh! That was the starting point of what drove her life off the rails. Lisa understood her own nature. She was both glad and proud to have been born a woman. Never once did she consider competing for a position with a man. Besides, the question of superiority or inferiority never made much sense in the grand scheme of things to begin with. Yeah. Men and women were two essential cogs for society. You can't have one without the other. They couldn't live without the other, and they never needed to compete. If men took arms to battle, then women had their own battlefields to fight on. That was what she believed as she progressed up the social stratum. But now she found herself caught in a position between the two cogs, and she couldn't help but find it ironic. For there already was another woman in the very same spot long before her. Eleanor von Wittenberg. She had been also part of the BDM, and had graduated with the highest honors. While not in the same fashion as Lisa, she too was the face of German women. She was the first female German officer. That, coupled with her family's respectable status, allowed her to attain a position so high propaganda labeled her the warrior princess. At the time, Lisa had a higher rank, but Eleanor possessed more social influence. That was something Lisa could not stand. It wasn't a rivalry or anything like that. She just found Eleanor dangerous. Simple as that. She could not acknowledge her. There were girls at Lebensborn who adore, admired Eleanor. So much so that there were some who said their dream was to join the army just like her. That was something Lisa simply could not, couldn't accept. She believed that men and women had their own spheres, and that it was common courtesy not to cross over into the other. Oh. Hmm. In other words, Lisa was a conservative while Eleanor was a liberal, and in this case the latter was the one getting more support. Uh-oh. As such, Lisa thought she was dangerous. She knew full well that Eleanor, in truth, was disgusted by their own gender. Normal women could never imitate her, and she offered no aid or sympathy for those who tried. After all, even the Fuhrer of their Third Reich had once remarked that the country would fall apart if women began to self-assert themselves. Well, he was sexist. I don't know, That's that was, that was mean. So her pers- Why the fuck am I even talking about that? So her personal views and feelings aside, in terms of ability and the circumstances of their country, Eleanor's psychophants had virtually no chance of finding reward and happiness. And Lisa wished to stop that. That woman was special. Abnormal. Her stories were nothing more than a sham. An imitation of the Nibelungen... Nibel... Nibelungen... Nibelungen's ride of the Valkyries built up by propagandists to appeal to the Führer's love of opera. As a modern country, Germany didn't deny women civil rights and spirit of independence, but once they got too strong, the government would start to suppress them. The battlefield for women known as the Fount of Life that Lisa had nurtured was about to fall into a dangerous position. Those in power were all generally cruel and cool-headed. She couldn't stand the idea of Lebensborn becoming a mere farm where women were treated as livestock or machines made for the sole purpose of giving birth. But what could she do? Trapped by such anguished thoughts, Lisa found her answer on December 24th, 1939, a date which changed her life forever. There was a man known as Reinhard Heydrich. There was a man known as Karl Kraft. Lisa could clearly see what dangerous beings those two were, but at the same time, she was enchanted by their power. She would gain strength under their command and overpower Eleanor, so that the common women of the world would not stray off track to protect the values of the Fount of Life. That was what she thought, what she believed. Lisa sold her soul to the devil. Was that a sound decision? 
Eh, eh, was it worth it? Eh, no. Back then, she felt she had no other choice. One could say she was nigh obsessed. For Eleanor, too, had sold her soul to the devil. She, too, had been enchanted by the very same men on the same day as Lisa. Eleanor would join them and gain even more power. So if Lisa didn't follow suit, she'd end up left far behind. I'm actually wondering if we're actually going to kind of get, like, that sort of backstory with all of these, you know, all the villains. Kind of see who they were before they become, you know, members of the Obsidian Round Table. And she couldn't let them come to pass. And with this, I am kind of getting a glimpse into Lisa before she became a member of the Obsidian Round Table. So that's... I'm a, that, that, that's at least being satisfied there, so thanks. Hence... A darker side to the fount of life, Lebensborn was born on that day. To begin with, the organization had been established for the proliferation of the German population and the preservation of their bloodline's purity. Women's, a woman, pfft, women's duty to the fatherland was to keep their bloodlines going, to give birth to new lives, raise them, and send them off into the world. As long as they kept that, they would preserve their people's identity and keep the country stable. The act of giving birth and raising life, the holy mission of creating thoroughbreds. Thoroughbreds? In that sense, there wasn't much of a difference between what they did on the surface and what they did behind closed doors. Where, where the definitive difference lay was exactly what kind of thoroughbreds they aimed to create. Oh. In other words, this is what they did in the new Lebensborn. Uh, change the screen blood red and have weird, creepy children speaking in the background? Is that what they did in Lebensborn? Because if so, they might be able to write a horror story about that. <laughs> You might have a cerebral hemorrhage then. Okay, so a hundred is the king of staring contests. The goal of the organization shifted to creating Ubermensch, children born with channels normal people didn't possess. Most of them lived short lives as they would end up destroying themselves by being unable to control their own powers. Ugh. There was a purpose to giving them codes for names. It was the most effective way to deprive them of identity, essentially detaching them both from society and the, ev the every concept of common sense. In short, they were treated like prisoners. <laughs> Yet the children smiled. Of course they did. They were made that way. Kind of puts me in the mind of that creepypasta happy puppet syndrome. By this point in time, Lisa's original intention had long been abandoned. It wasn't as though she had forgotten them. She simply had no time. It was a stark contradiction for a woman who was meant to nurture lives to end up exploiting them. But she had to get results even if it meant a thousand failures. The situation was just that pressing. The tide of war was turning against them. The destruction of the Fatherlands was looking more and more viable by the day. She had to make a turnabout. And then Schreiber was born! I, that, oh my god, I hope it doesn't lead to that. That'd be, that'd be a hell of a twist if Schreiber was like Lisa's son or something. As she watched the corpses of children pile up behind closed doors at Lebensborn, Lisa dreamed that their sacrifices would save Germany's future. She was well aware of how harsh the loss of war could be. Among her comrades were savages that had been born precisely through the twisted state of affairs that previous defeat had caused. She couldn't let Germany return back to that state. It was her duty as a woman. Oh! Hey! The two commanders of the Obsidian Round Table admired her. Karl Croft, in particular, frequented Lebensborn. Okay, 
That doesn't look like... Sh that's not Hydrix, so I'm guessing this must be, uh... Mercurius? His mysterious and uncanny presence stood out above all else to Lisa, but the children were much more split. They were those who found him charming, and those who found him creepy. The ones who found him creepy were mainly children who could actually see into others. She could easily guess that he'd had some sort of looted past, but if that was all they'd been afraid of, Lisa wouldn't have been all that surprised. However, it appeared that was not the case. <laughs> They couldn't see what they should have. The Esper children described the man as a moving illustration. Yes, their count had already reached four digits. Oh, they're literally just named after numbers, aren't they? Dear God! Ta thousand! Thousand! Fuck! It was too much for Lisa. The numbers reminded her of the amount of children she had killed. She had decided to start labeling them by something else. <laughs> だからダメなんだよ。大きくなっちゃったらダメだって。ねえ、君の名前はナンバー僕はもうそういうのじゃないんだよ。前に当然とか数字を気にするようになって止まっちゃったんでしょ。おう。うん。なんだか変なこと言ってたの。ここはお墓だって。変だよね。what is your name, child? Marine Blue. Marine Blue. Now they're being named after colors! Huh. Huh. Here, an Ubermensch referred to those who could endure Karl Kraft's sorcery. Not being part of the normal himself, he did not possess the eyes of a common man. He did not care for the bottom line, and as such, his sorcery possessed no versatility. In the end, only an Ubermensch could give birth to Ubermensch through this method. But then, what was to be done? Lisa already knew the answer. Both in public and behind doors, Lebensborn had been realized under the field of eugenics. Put simply, the children of geniuses had a higher chance of becoming geniuses themselves, so crossing talented men and women should yield the best results. The process of creating human thoroughbreds. Karl Croft's sorcery, the transmutation of gold, the conjuration of immortality, the swastika. And at the core of it all was Viridis. Viridis? Viridis. Son and kind, the divine children of the sun. Hmm. 
He said let out a th let a thousand children die just to give birth to one. At that point, she had but one last method her at her disposal. Eugenics. Just as the children of geniuses were geniuses themselves, so would the children of Ubermenschen also be Ubermenschen. The result appeared a year later. It was both a great success and a great failure. For by that point, Lisa had looked back on and reevaluated her deeds. The child she had conceived and gave birth to from her own womb truly was the monster she had desired. Oh! Isaac. Kinda giving me like a bit of an Edward Elric feel here. Isaac like his father. Oh, it just hit me. Mutter. That must be what they're referring to Lisa as. So, Lisa as Mutter. Indeed, she was scared of her own child. He couldn't bear to look at his eyes. Eyes that possessed all the five colors of Petichroma. His gaze always seemed disinterested by the world. He'd had teeth from the day he was born. Oh! His eye, his growth was beyond natural. By the time he was one, he already looked like a five-year-old, and he'd probably look ten in another year. The more he grew each day, the more he resembled his father. As such, she couldn't bear to look him in the eye. He was a living reminder of her past sins. What had she done? What in the world has she been thinking? For the fatherland? For the future? Ridiculous. Reinhard Heydrich and Karl Kraft never cared for such things. Lisa had finally opened her eyes to reality. But as a result, she couldn't run away from the guilt that accompanied her return to sanity. She had to atone for her sins. That was why both the transmutation of gold and sun and kind, who was to be its sacrifice, were necessary. Isaac saw no one or anything. His gaze was just like his father's. It treated all and everything as inconsequential pebbles on the road. He feared those eyes, but at the same time, deep down, Lisa was somewhat relieved. Because... Because she felt like this child was one she could sacrifice. After all, she had another. So, Silver? Oh, this is Johan. He's got his mom's mole. Lisa felt him true to be truly be her son. The child whose magical aptitude had all been taken by his older brother. And as such, leaving him a perfectly ordinary boy. Indeed, Lisa had given Isaac up to this obsidian round table and had Johann flee Berlin when its end drew near. 
She told her comrades he had died, and they believed her story. Lisa was indeed very skilled at cover-ups, and they'd never had any interest in Johan's fate as so long as they could, as they had I Isak in any case. I'm guessing that's how it's really pronounced, not Isaac, but Isak. Uh, I'll let you guys kind of help me on this one. As a result, Isak set the swastikas into operation when Berlin fell. Isak had been forced to manifest Reinhard's creation figment, the castle for all eternity. Oh, his creation figment's a castle. His soul still formed the core of the Devil's Lair to this date. Isak, abandoned by his mother and brother. ええ。誰もいない。怖がってごめんね。仲間外れにしてごめんね。みんなで君のところに行くから。僕らは同じ泉の兄弟だから。だけどそれじゃ今度はヨハンが一人ぼっちになっちゃうから。あの子も引きず
仲間に入れてあげよう。そうしよう。<laughs> yeah. Seriously, I'm like, weirdly enough, I feel like I'm hearing Furuto Erika in there. The innocent voices of children echoed all around me. I understood their circumstances and why they sympathized when we. I also learned all about Kasumi. So. Sorry. But I don't have time to play with you anymore. I'm scared of losing her, so I'll be going. Well, I mean, to be fair, you've already made mention that yes, this is your home, and it's also kind of really messed up. And the more I look at it, I'm just getting a little bit scared, and I just, I'm starting to ramble at this point. I had to make up for destroying her home all those years ago. Couldn't stay here forever. And so I woke up. I couldn't just keep sleeping like that. She wanted to protect me. She thought to steal my chance to shine in the spotlight and resolve everything by herself before I woke up. Yeah, I could definitely sympathize with that idea. Anyone would. I'd have done the same myself. I too had been fine with shedding blood and taking the full brunt of everything head on if it meant keeping my loved ones out of danger. I thought it was okay if I shouldered everything by myself. It was no spirit of martyrdom or anything that noble. Just my egotism. I knew that much. I knew it, but I couldn't help it. I mean, anyone had something or someone more important than themselves in their lives. To me, that was Kasumi. And to her, that was me. That was all there was to it. I sat up. I wanted to protect her just as much as she wanted to protect me. The children of Lebensborn had already vanished. They had possessed me back at the amusement park, and though I normally shouldn't have woken until everything had ended, here I was awake. I probably hadn't woken up out of sheer willpower or anything. It was more likely they found something in a deeper layer of my consciousness than even they couldn't affect. Something that both Kasumi and Father Tarifa had failed to take into account. I hadn't seen, heard, or even felt her presence all that much lately, but she, st she still saved me. I couldn't let that go to waste. Good job, Marie! Now that I was awake, I couldn't just sit back and leave everything up to Kasumi. That wasn't my style. Just like she was trying to do all she could, I too would do all of what I was here to do. <clears throat> Morning! Wait, did you guys have the same dream? The children of Levensborn would entrap those denied a parental love. It seemed Shiro and Honjo had received their own fair share of the spell and had fallen asleep too. They entered the room rubbing their eyes. Huh? Ah, those two were sharp. They had understood everything with barely a word. We'd been given the shaft by Kasumi and Father Tarifa, but this was where the main event truly began. In that moment, we had learned nearly everything about the situation and were in perfect sync. Now was time for us to turn the tables. Okay. She is skilled with Kendo. Honjo made a wry smile. Well, I'm not sure. 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 I'm not sure
Of course. <laughs> okay, this was a battle of our egos. She gave me a slap in the face, so I couldn't help but want to return the favor. Okay, I kind of wanted to give these idiots a smack right now. Or, I'm sorry. I kind of wanted to give those idiots a smacking too now. But an argument was the last thing we needed at this point. Sure. We knew where Kasumi was going. Mm-hmm. That was where we'd have our final battle. All that was left were Wilhelm, Sakurai, and Valeria Trifa. We had to get rid of all three of them in a single sweep. Hmm. The first member of the Obsidian Table I encountered was neither Wilhelm nor Rusalka, but Father Tarifa. I still haven't forgotten the day I went to the church with him. And Timuro. I voiced my resolve and left a bottomless pit with Shiro and Honjo. Oh! Alright. Swastika 6 out of 8. Chapter 12. Skeleton in the Closet. End. What do you know? I completed an entire chapter this time. <sighs> Alright. This seems like a pretty darn good place for us to go ahead and end it for right now. Especially considering, I don't know, if it really is going to be the final battle or not. Who the hell knows? Then again, we're still on the first route. You guys weren't kidding when you said that this is going to be a long novel. I'm not backing out of what I said, though. We're going to do this whole thing in one entire sweep. Mostly because I really don't feel I'm going to... I don't think I'm going to actually need a break for this. At least, I, I don't think so. This isn't sim This isn't like, you know, the whole Fate Stay Night fiasco. That, that, that novel I needed a bit of a break from. This one, I think I can handle doing in a full sweep. Kind of like what I did with Tokyo Babel. Which, getting, again getting into that mindset like I did with Tokyo Babel, I'm about enjoying, I'm actually enjoying this novel as much as I did back then, which was pretty good. Also, kind of kind of cheesy title there, Dawn of the Final, but I don't know. I know that's pretty cheesy, I realize that. But, okay. We learned a little bit about Ren's backstory, and I'm guessing that friend had to have been Shiro. So they killed his father, who had some sort of, like, mad scientist, like, dungeon-slash-lab down the basement. It didn't really go into full detail about what his father did, but I can make an assumption that it certainly wasn't legal in any manner. So I can kind of understand these kids killing the dad, but I, a slight- like, this sounds so weird saying kids killing the dad! But I can see why they did it if my assumption is ba is correct on what that guy was doing down in the basement. So, yeah, I'm actually happy that I learned at least a little bit more about Ren's backstory, too. But anyway, guys, like I said, that's where I'm going to end it. Seems like next episode's going to be quite a bit of fun, and God damn it, Kasumi, you can't fucking stand up against them! You're, you got mad kendo skills, but unless you suddenly reabsorbed a portion of Marie's power, you're not gonna do much of anything. Actually, you could probably team up with Shiro and you'd be able to do at least something. But you gotta do let all the damage dealing be done by Ren, you know? Anyway, guys, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Hello there, everybody. Sabata Night 2 here, and if you like this video, be sure to let me know in the comments down below. And hey, if you guys like my content, then maybe you'd like to check out another channel who I think deserves equal attention. So click that nightmare emblem and check out that channel, or go to the links in the description down below. Once again, thank you, and I'll see you guys in the next video.